All right, we are now live. I will start with Ms. Bettis, who has her hand raised, ready to make an announcement on her case. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, I'm here this morning on a civil case. Amado Martinez III um, is my client. Looking for my CR number, I apologize. CL 19 0265 H. All right, Amado Martinez III versus Ephraim Ochoa. That's Michael Guerra is on the other side. Good morning, Your Honor. Michael Guerra here on behalf of the defendant. Good morning. We have a motion to compel. Is that your motion, Ms. Pettis? No, Your Honor. That is Mr. Guerra's motion. Okay, Mr. Guerra. Your Honor, I'm just wanting to get depots on the books on this case and get this case worked up. Uh, do depots, then proceed to mediation, see if we can try to get this matter settled. Your Honor, we're not in opposition to any of that. The problem that I'm having, and I say we because Ms. Richardson was also, I think she made the last announcement for me on here. She's joined me on the case. I'm having problems communicating with my client, Your Honor. He's a truck driver on the road, and I believe I'm going to end up having to maybe send some, some certified mail or something because we've been having a lot of problems getting him to return calls or, or getting in touch with him, Your Honor. And so we're just asking for a little bit of time to do that. I think that Ms. Richardson made that same announcement, but we're in the same position at this point as we've not had communication with our client. Your Honor, uh, if I may, uh, Reggie Richardson, judge for the record for Mr. Martinez. Um, Your Honor, the announcement that I had made of uh, the court recall was regarding attempt to communicate with Mr. Martinez to facilitate um, hopefully resolution uh, of the case. And so um, this was not too long ago, uh, Your Honor, uh, before Your Honor considers granting a motion to compel, um, if we could have, if we could have a week, Judge, it, it, for me to attempt um, meaningful communication um, so that we may be able to avoid further litigation. All right. Let me uh, let me take a look real quick, Ms. Richardson, Ms. Bettis, Mr. Guerra. I, uh, I feel com you know I, I really definitely want for Ms. Richardson and Ms. Bettis to communicate with their client. Obviously, okay. that's important. and, and I, I understand that, Your Honor. I, I'm not looking to put either of them uh, in a bad spot, but I, I'm just trying to work up the case, Your Honor. Yeah, no, no, I understand. How about this may this may be something that that gets resolved, Judge, just for your honor's information. How about I give you uh, May fourth, May fourth, at eight thirty, nine thirty, May fourth, twenty twenty two, at nine thirty, Miss Richardson, and uh, we'll just carry over the motion to compel to that day. So we're just basically buying both of y'all two weeks to try to communicate with your client and see where we're at. Motion to compel will be carried over to May fourth, nine thirty, if that's okay with everyone. Thank you, yes, your honor. honor. Perfect. That's all Thank I you, have. May I be excused? Both, all three of you are excused unless y'all have other matters before the court. I, I have no <laughs> other business before this honorable court. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you, Judge. Mr. Reyes, what do you have? Good morning, Your Honor. I have F1991-19-8 in the, my client. Out of the marriage of Antonio Garcia Jr. and Dora Elia Canizales and in the interest of minor children. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Samuel Reyes on behalf of Dora Canizales, Your Honor. And this is set for a motion for entry of temporary orders that uh, Mr. Guerra had filed. And the court allowed me some time to review the numbers from the OAG, Your Honor. And, and at this time, I would just like to say I'm not opposed to the granting of the, uh, of the motion for entry of temporary orders. Perfect. I saw Mr. Guerra uh, peek in his head earlier. We were conducting drug court. So I know he's here in the building. I'm assuming there, he has no opposition either. Mr. Alcantad, you're here on behalf of the Attorney General's office. There's no issues on behalf of the AG's office? That is correct, Your Honor. We have no objection or issues. Perfect. And has an order already been submitted to the court? I'm not certain, Judge, but uh, I he will- submit it with his order, his motion, I'm sorry. Okay, and are you okay with that, the language of that particular order, Mr. Reyes? Yes, yes Judge. Okay. So Mr. Guerra's order, I will sign. Let me just make sure. That's all I have this morning, Your Honor. Okay, it's not looking like I have an order, but we will contact Mr. Reyes, I mean, sorry, Mr. Guerra to submit an order. I just wanted to make sure that if there was an order there that you had reviewed, Mr. Reyes, that you had no op objection to it. Yes, Judge, it's the order that uh, Mr. Guerra and, and the OAG have been circulating. And so we're gonna be unopposed to that, Judge. So. 
it'll it'll order to come, Your Honor. Can you assist the court also in getting with Mr. Guerra to submit that? I, I at least right now, initially, the staff is telling me that we don't have it. Yes, Judge. I think it'll submit, think it'll submit it as an exhibit with this motion, but we'll let him know. Let me see. Do you know motion exhibit? Okay, that's why. We'll get an order. We'll get an order filed, Your Honor. Uh, well, it's fine. Yeah, apparently it's an exhibit, so the clerks won't send it. It has to be a lead exhibit. Can we can we just get that and sign off on it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna get the one that he submitted since y'all have reviewed it. I'll print. I'll print it out. I'll sign off on it. We'll, we're good to go. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank, you, Judge. thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Rubio, what do you have? Good morning, Your Honor. I have CL nineteen four six eight seven H. Jessica Rodriguez versus HEB Groceries Company LP. Um, George Rubio on behalf of Plaintiff Jessica Rodriguez. Your Honor, Victor Vicinez here on behalf of the defendant, HEB. And I believe we are here for a status conference hearing. All right, that's CL 194687H. Uh, currently sitting, I'm. what I was told is, is that the first one on the docket uh, will wash out. And so that puts you all at number one for the week of trial on the 9th of May with the docket call on the 5th. Where are we, Mr. Rubio and Mr. Vixen Ice? Lee, we're ready to try the case, Your Honor. We've uh, mediated, we've done some depots. So at this point, I think um, we weren't successful in mediation. So I think we're ready to move forward. Your Honor, uh, HEB is also ready, but I, I did notice this morning and looking at the file that I have another trial setting in Rio Grande City that same day. Of course, it's too early, I think, for me to tell you that I, that case will go. The age of the case is roughly the same. I, I didn't check the month, but it's a 2017 case uh, or 2017. I think it's an older case. This was filed in 2019, Judge. So I do have another trial setting, but uh, we're announcing ready as well. All right, I'm going to put both of you all down as ready. Again, you're number, sitting at number one of three for the week. So um, please get ready. Uh, I, we will visit again on the 5th. If there's any limiting motions or anything that you need to have heard on that day, please come prepared so that we can hear them on that Thursday for Dr. Call at 1.30 on the 5th of May. Yes, Thank Judge. And as, as I as I informed the court, I do have another trial setting, but I will I will uh, advise the court of, of that of that issue at that at that May fifth uh, hearing. Stay in contact with Mr. Rubio, okay? Yes, Judge. We will. And Your Honor, do you think on on that hearing on the fifth we'll have an idea about a panel and so forth, and that way I can kind of get interpreters and I'm not I don't remember if we needed one or not, but get all that situated. Yeah, I mean, I would say, Mr. Rubio, at this point, uh, as far as we're concerned, since you're sitting at number one, there's nothing in front of you that's going to deter this case from going to trial uh, other than Mr. V.C. Nice's calendar. And so at that point, um, visit with Mr. V.C. Nice, maybe his calendar will clear up. And uh, and if it doesn't, then we'll have to uh, have you guys play paper, rock, scissors or something, see how we get to try, how we get this uh, taken care of. Yes, we'll Judge, I'll be in touch with Mr. Rubio. Okay. Sounds, Sounds great. Good. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you, Judge. May I be excused? Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Guerra, are you available? All right. That looks like he's not. So we'll go to Mr. Kettler. Good morning, Judge. John Kettler for plaintiff on three default cases uh, and all three of them have settlement announcements i'd like to make the first one is cl 190623h portfolio and lopez you should have a proposed agreed judgment in your queue for that one and we're respectfully requesting signature of the agreed judgment or we'll go ahead and sign off on that proposed agreed judgment and the second one, Judge, is CL 191290H portfolio. And exact same thing with that one, Judge. Uh, proposed agreed judgment should be in your queue. All right. Proposed agreed judgment will be granted. And the final one, Judge, is CL 2377H Jefferson Capital Systems and Suarez. Uh, for this one, it I believe the plaintiff and defendant need a little bit additional time to finalize their paperwork. If I could request uh, one more reset on this file, then that would be great. Can I give you 30 days? I think that should be more than enough, Judge. Okay. 
All right, how about May 23rd, 2022 at 9.30, Mr. Uh, Kettler? All right, I've got a judge and that's my third and final one may excuse. Your excuse, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, let me go back to Mr. Guerra. Mr. Guerra. Yeah, I apologize, judge. I couldn't uh, hit the mute button quick enough. No worries, what number are you here on? Um, I don't have the docket here, Your Honor. It's it, uh, number. CL 221090H, uh, Mariano Gonzalez versus Joseph Richt. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. I'm not sure if there's anybody on the other side. Uh, the record shows that they were properly served uh, to t temporary restraining order. Uh, there's no uh, answer to file. Uh, if there's nobody on the other side, Your Honor, I'd like to go ahead and just extend the, the 14 days and and see if they'll respond or I'll talk to the attorneys. All right, is I dealt with them here? before. All right, is anyone here on behalf of Joseph Richt? R-I-T-C-H. Anyone here on behalf of Joseph Richt? Let me go ahead and extend the TRO for an additional two weeks. Reset two weeks. May 4th, 2022, 9.30, Mr. Guetta. May 4th, 2022. Thank you, Ron. If you can submit an order extending, please. Y yes, sir. May I Thank be excused? You. You're excused. Thank you, Ron. Mr. Stephen Hudgens. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Good here morning. On, I'm here on cause number CL 23593-H. All right. This is uh, Raquel Canales versus Damaris Favela and Javier Favela. Yes. Good morning, Judge Juan Raul Guajardo for the plaintiffs. Motion for summary judgment. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, I don't have anybody else raising their hand, so I will hear this. Uh, this is um, defendant's motion for summary judgment. Yes, Your Honor. I represent Damaris and Javier Fabella. They're the defendants. And just a little background on the case. I'm sure the courts read uh, the motions and the response and replies, but uh, this is an incident that occurred when the Fabellas and Miss Canales were next door neighbors to one another. Uh, the, the, the Fabellas no longer live next door to Miss Canales. They, they're building a house somewhere else, so they've moved away. But uh, the, the fact is pretty simple. This is a, a, a dog bite incident that occurred in my client's, the defendant's backyard, not the front yard, but the defendant's backyard, while our dog, the defendant's dog, was tethered to a chain that kept him entirely within our property line. Uh, prior to the incident, um, the plaintiff had uh, two dogs, small dogs that she let out in her backyard to, I think, go to the bathroom. One of them ran in to my client's backyard where, wherein the plaintiff decided to go into our backyard without her permission to retrieve the dog and that's when the incident occurred. And so the plaintiff is now suing my client for the for the injuries she suffered because she was nipped at or bitten by my dog while he was in his backyard tethered to a chain. And I think the case law is fairly clear. They've got two bases for their claims. They've got a premises liability claim. Uh, you know, my argument and my motion set forth the fact that I believe at the time the plaintiff was, uh, was a trespasser. She came onto our property without our permission. It's our backyard. Therefore, the duty owed to her is not to injure her either willfully, wantonly, or through gross negligence. And based upon that, that duty, I don't think there's any evidence that we did injure her willfully, wantonly, or through gross negligence based upon the facts. So I don't believe she can make a premises liability claim. Uh, plaintiff has responded to that argument, claiming that she went into our backyard due to necessity and therefore she might be considered a licensee. I dispute that, but even if she were a licensee, the duty owed to her licensee is to not injure that person, obviously the same duty you owed for a trespasser, but also to warn the licensee of conditions, dangerous conditions that we know about, that my client knows about, and that the plaintiff does not know about. It's obviously different than an invitee. We have to warn of conditions that you knew or should have known about. Plaintiff's knowledge is irrelevant, but on a licensee, the plaintiff's knowledge is relevant. She's claiming my dog, you know, bitter. She knew our dog was in the backyard. So I don't know what warning we needed to give her if she was going to go into our backyard without our permission about our dog, because she testified that she went into our backyard to retrieve her little dog 
that came into our backyard in response to my dog barking. So I think the claims for premises defect fail as a matter of law, but most importantly, because I believe she's a trespasser, but even if the court were to entertain plaintiff's argument that she might be considered a licensee under the facts of the case, the dangerous condition she's claiming about our dog, she knew about it when she went into our yard. So I don't think they can make a premises defect claim in this matter. If you want me to stop right there, there's one other claim. They've got a strict liability claim for a dangerous animal. Uh, and we, I can address that unless you want to, unless you have any questions regarding the premises defect claim. So let, so let me ask you this. Um, was the dog, you said the dog was tethered in the backyard, chained. Uh, what, let's start off with what kind of dog? It's a mastiff. Okay, so a big dog. He's a big dog, yes. A big dog. And did he break the chain in an effort to try to get to the uh, plaintiff? Or did he, did the plaintiff was within the area that the dog was tethered to? The, the latter. The, okay. the, dog did not, the dog did not get off the chain. Uh, you know, I think the testimony from both part, well, from my client, he was sitting in his kitchen, I think, having breakfast when this occurred and heard a commotion. And the dog was basically tethered to a chain right behind their back door. And uh, there's no evidence, nor is there any allegation, as far as I know, that our dog broke loose and somehow that's how the attack occurred. All right. Uh, and, and I guess my next question is, is, was the dog able to get to the plaintiff uh, at the door, at the gate? Because that could be a surprise, right? You, you open the gate trying to retrieve a ball, trying to retrieve a dog, trying to retrieve anything, and the dog is able to reach the gate, and therefore it's a surprise the moment you open the gate or was the dog at such a distance that the gate was open. She obviously saw the dog and then still continued to, you know, approach. No, I, I, I left out a, a, a one, one, one fact that I, I assume plaintiff's counsel will think is important. There was a fence between our client's uh, yard, like most backyards that you'll see. Right. Okay. The allegation is that our dog and another dog we own prior to this incident that we've gotten rid of before this incident occurred, I guess we're chewing at the fence, doing damaging the fence so much so that the plaintiff decided she needed to replace that fence. Okay. There's testimony that she asked for my client to help pay with that. My client said she, they offered, but there's a dispute as to who was going to pay for it. Nonetheless, at some point, the plaintiff decided to go ahead and just replace that wooden fence on her own, just you know, an eight foot seven foot, whatever, uh, wooden fence that you've seen all over town. And it was during the process of when the fence was being replaced, the fencers came out, took the fence down because you got to take the old one down before you put the new one in before they had, had installed the new one was when the incident occurred. In other words, the plaintiff hired someone to replace the fence. She let her dogs out in her backyard, knowing that there was now not a fence between her yard and the defendant's yard. And that's when the and that's when her dog decided to go into our backyard. There was no gate, there was no fence. It had been removed by plaintiff because she was replacing it. That's okay. when. The, so, so let me ask you, Shelly. Let me ask you, what, what was the size of uh, the plaintiff's dog? Were we talking about a little Yorkshire Terrier, up yeah. against Mastiff? Yes, oh. exactly right. And so the little dog, she left her dog in her backyard off leash, knowing that there was no boundary between her yard and the yard where my client's dog lived. And my, once again, my client's dog was tethered to a chain that, that, you know, kept him inside the property line. I don't think there's any evidence regarding, because it didn't happen. Our dog didn't have the ability to get on her property. This happened entirely within our, our backyard when this incident occurred. And so uh, that, that's simply the facts of the case. So the, the question really what it boils down to can, can a dog owner be responsible if somebody comes into their backyard and gets nipped at or bitten by their dog who's tethered to a chain? Uh, right. I don't think the law in Texas allows that, you know, that this, this was, this dog was in a place it had every right to be. This dog was tethered to <laughs> when you were roaming around. Uh, and so now if, if, if we're going to decide that they can bring this case forward, I guess dog owners can be liable if, someone comes into their backyard, whether because the fence is down or not down or whatever reason, and it, they get bitten by their dog tethered to a chain. I just don't think that's the law in the state of Texas, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Wajardo, your response? Good morning, Judge. Um, not only were there a lot of uh, a lot of holes in that 
in that sense, there's a lot of holes in what uh, council is trying to portray here. Um, to begin with, there, the, there, there was, let me add to the facts here, there, there is a, that cedar fence, it's a six foot cedar fence that my client owned, the uh, plaintiff owned. Uh, there is video, we've already done discovery, Judge, um, where the fence was severely damaged by uh, the English uh, uh, dog, uh, this huge, large dog. And um, there's also the neighbors, the defendant had had that uh, uh, English uh, Mastiff dog and a larger, another large dog, a female dog, which they eventually got rid of. But they were not always changed to the fence, Judge. Uh, these dogs were running loose. And because my client has two small dogs, she has a Yorkie and a Maltese. I mean, they're mostly indoor dogs, but they go outside to do their business. And, you know, the law doesn't require that she have them on a chain when they go to the backyard. So, you know, they do go to the backyard or do their business. And um, these dogs had damaged the fence to such a degree that there is video. We've done discovery. We've showed it to defend and he has... Uh, Mr. Hudgens has a copy of all these videos. Uh, these dogs were so much trying to get into defend into plaintiff's property that they damaged the fence so much. We even have a video of the English Mastiff uh, um, jumping above the fence to look into the plaintiff's yard. It's, it's astonishing. I've never seen that before. And uh, the defendant acknowledged that he hadn't seen that before, that that was amazing. Uh, he was pretty surprised himself. So these two dogs did a lot of damage to the fence. Um, at some point, uh, Ms. Canales sent the defendant a letter or, or talked to the defendants first and asked them to help him repair the, the fence. Apparently they said no, or they didn't have any money or whatnot. So she sought, I guess, some advice from a uh, small claims court. At that point, they told her to send a letter, a certified letter that, you know, demanding some uh, compensation for the repairs. She had done that, but they never responded. So the fence needed, she was afraid that these two dogs would come into her yard. So she took it upon herself to fix this, this fence. And as uh, construction has it, you know, you would need to take some part down and rebuild or start putting some, some of the fence back. That's when the defendants decided to get rid of the female dog and kept the English Mastiff. They, that's when they, that only then, that's when they changed that dog uh, tethered them to, to the property. Um, on one of the occasions uh, that the small Yorkie went out, you know, to do his business, the dog, uh, the, the English Mastiff, uh, kept on barking over. So dogs being what they are, the Yorkie ran over to the, uh, the other side to the defendant's property. And uh, the plaintiff trying to avoid her dog from being mauled, ran over and, and grabbed the dog. But at that point, you know, the defendant's dog more than nipped her. He broke her finger and bit her hand and her arm. So at that point, that's when the defendant came out and assisted her and, and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, so that's, that's generally what happened, Judge. Uh, the law on uh, trespass is if there is an emergency of the plaintiff, you can trespass into someone else's property and you would have that duty owed as a licensee. Now I understand that's a fact issue that might be having that might have to be determined by a jury, but it's not a simple matter as her being a trespasser. Now the law doesn't even say that the defendant needed to have created the danger. In this particular case, the defendants did create the danger. They were negligent in that way by not withholding their dogs sooner from creating this damage. Um, Mr. Hudgens also forgot to mention that the English Mastiff had attacked a child before at a park. So this dog had a history of being vicious and the defendants knew about it. So those, those fact scenarios are pretty important for a jury to consider. And uh, we do have two causes of action, Judge. We have a negligence cause of action and we have a strict liability cause of action. And the strict liability, the owner needs to know of the uh, dog's viciousness, which in this case they knew, not only by the fact that they had attacked a child before, this dog had attacked a child before, 
But this dog broke a fence, kept on breaking a fence, kept on trying to get into defendant's property, into plaintiff's property, I'm sorry, was trying to jump over the fence and caused a lot of damage. So that would give a reasonable person uh, the knowledge that there's something wrong with this dog, that this dog is vicious. Um, so that's point number two in the strict liability. They would have to have actual knowledge or constructive knowledge. And point number three is that these injuries caused to the plaintiffs were that caused by the propensities that the owner knew or had reasonable knowledge to know, constructive knowledge, that would happen. So that's exactly what happened here. So they're strictly liable for one, and two, they're definitely negligent in being that they owed the, uh, a duty to the owner, uh, they breached that duty, and that duty caused some damages and injuries to the family. So that's basically uh, our, our argument, Your Honor. I think foreseeability in the negligence aspect of it is going to be a big issue, something that the jury needs to consider. Um, so that's basically where we're at, Judge. All right, uh, Mr. Hudgens, anything else to add? Yeah, I, I agree with what, you know, 85, 90% of what uh, Mr. Guajardo said as far as you know, how the incident occurred. And, and I wasn't trying to mislead the court. I, 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 like I said earlier, that there was a fence that was missing. It wasn't gate that was open. Uh, but we need to focus on the fact that there are two causes of action. There's the negligence, which is basically the premises defect case. And then there's the strict liability, which I didn't get to in my, in my opening argument to the court. Back on the premises defect case, the accident occurred when the plaintiff trespassed onto our property. I want to, I know they want to claim it was an emergency, but this was an emergency if, if, if it qualifies as one that she created by letting her dog out into her backyard when she knew there wasn't a fence between the two properties and doing it off leash. This isn't a situation where our dogs knock the fence down and then five seconds later her dog ran into our property this fence had been down for a day or two so she was fully aware that there wasn't a fence in between the property lines and unlike my client who tethered his dog to a chain to keep it in, inside his yard while the fence was down the plaintiff for whatever reason decided to let her dog out in the backyard and then when her dog decided to go into our backyard, that's the emergency she wants to claim justifies her uh, in trespassing. I, I, I disagree with that position. I don't think she can create an emergency, create a situation that then allows her to trespass on our property. Uh, no more than if she had thrown a Frisbee onto our property and decided to go under our property. Same thing, she let her dog get under our property. She doesn't have a right to go and come onto our property with our permission regardless of what, you know, the circumstances are. But even if, even if the court decides that she's a licensee, once again, the condition she's claiming uh, about is the dog, which she had full knowledge of. And as a licensee, if she has full knowledge of the, of the, of the alleged dangerous condition, then we don't have a duty to warn her about it. There's nothing we need to tell her about because she already knows about the condition. So that's the premises defect case. On the strict liability case, the dangerous animal uh, statute, uh, the plaintiff has pointed to this one incident, which my client acknowledged occurred at a dog park a year or so before the incident where Toby, which is the name of the Mastiff, uh, was playing and, and jumped on the back of a ch child that was there and scratched the child. My client does not characterize it as an attack. He characterizes it as a big dog jumping on a kid trying to have fun. That's the only incident we know about. Uh, the plaintiff herself has testified that she never saw our dog act aggressively towards anyone. My client testified that that had never occurred. That they had had the dog, raised it from a puppy. It was very well-natured. They walked it on a leash. All that said, even if we want to agree that this constitutes a dangerous dog under the statute, which I don't think it does. It doesn't constitute an animal that had dangerous propensities abnormal to its class. It was acting as any mastiff would act. Those propensities weren't a producing cause of this incident. The cause of this incident was Miss uh, Canales coming onto our property. You know, if, if she had not come onto our property, none of this would ever occur. If she had not let her dog off leash in her backyard, knowing there wasn't a fence between the two, none of this would have occurred. Those are the that even though it's a strict liability statute, you still have to have causation in fact. You have to have cause in fact, and I've 
I pointed the court to that in a reply I filed over the weekend. And causation is, is a matter of law. This would not have occurred but for her coming onto our property without our permission. Now, Mr. Hudgens, <clears throat> obviously, and I don't know whether Mr. Wajardo is going to make this argument, but I would, I would imagine that his argument is going to go a step further and say, but for the actions of the Mastiff chewing up the fence, their fence would not have to have gotten repaired. There would be a fence there. Then, so I guess the question is, does the Mastiff chewing the fence, causing it to be repaired, therefore causing it to be removed, uh, is that the cause causation part that we have to we have to talk about, right? I think that's too remote, Your Honor. I mean, it, it, it's, it'd be one thing if the master had chewed a hole in the fence, knocked it down. I'm reminded of this movie I used to love as a kid called The Sandlot, where there was this big dog on, on the yep. lot. I, I don't know what's weird. And, and, they, and the, the ball full of... Uh, and the, ball, yeah, and the, the baseballs. And it's a great movie. If you're a baseball fan, it's a wonderful baseball movie. But there's a scene where the dog is so big, that was like a big St. Bernard or something like that. Knock the fence over right? And because he was so big and knocked the fence over and therefore created this gap that was sitting there. And, it, you know, I, there'd be one thing if we were here, if my dog had caused the fence to fall over, plaintiff didn't know about it, let her dog in the backyard and he ran and she ran into their, our backyard. Uh, and then the incident occurred. That's that I, that I might understand, but that's not what happened here. This was your dog is damaging our fence. I want to repair it. And there are pictures of the fence, whether it actually needed to be repaired or not. I, that's a, up for debate. And my guy said, I'm not paying for the whole thing. Maybe I'll pay for part of it. And then she proceeded just to do it on her own and hired a fence company to come remove the fence. And during the time after the fence had been removed before they had erected the new fence is when this incident occurred. I, and to the extent that you want to hold my client now, they want to hold, the plaintiff wants to hold my client responsible for something that happened in the backyard uh, after that fence had been removed. How long, you know, does that go on? What if the plaintiff decided to have removed the fence and not replaced it for a month? Would that be too, too remote? Is it a week? Is it a day? My point is she knew the fence was down. I don't think she can now claim uh, that my client is somehow responsible for anything that happens if she goes into my client's backyard after she decided to remove the fence, even though she's claiming that we're the reason she had to remove the fence. Okay, well, how do, that's a good point. I mean, your client obviously knew that the fence had been removed. It wasn't like she let the dog out, didn't look to her right, uh, didn't see the fence missing because the plaintiffs, I'm sorry, the defendants had taken it upon themselves to remove the fence uh, in an effort to repair it. In this situation, she, your client, uh, took it upon herself to have a company out there. She knew that the company was there. She knew that the fence was gone and yet she let the dog out and the dog did what dogs do. And therefore then she chased the dog rather instinctual, but, uh, but she knew, I mean, she, she knew the fence was missing. Uh, how do we get around that? Well, judge. Um, yeah, she knew the fence was missing. She didn't know she was going to get bit by a dog. Now, the other thing that Mr. Hudgens left off is that that child that they claimed that the dog playfully jumped on his back, that child went to the emergency room. So defendant can always downplay anything he wants. The facts are what they are, Judge. Uh, there's documentation that this child, even the defendant himself testified that this child went to the emergency room. It's not a playful jump. So let me ask you this question then. If she knew that the dog was a dangerous dog, why did she go? Could you, are you claiming that it was an emergency and therefore she was trying to protect her dog and therefore... I mean, is there evidence to say that her dog was going to get mauled, did get mauled, was in the process of getting mauled? Judge, at no point have I said that she knew the dog was a, was a danger. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm, I was just saying the opposite. How would she know that the dog would bite her? Now, so, this how, so therefore, how? why the strict liability? It's not on her. The strict liability is on them, Judge. The strict li they knew they should have done more. There, I cited some case law in, the, in my response, Judge. What yeah. should they have done more? What? They didn't, they didn't remove the fence. So what should they have done more other than tether the dog? They could, well, and I put some examples there, Judge. They could have either used a kennel to keep the dog uh, away. They could, I mean, they did see enough to chain the dog. They could have done more. They could have removed him from the property for the time being while the fence was done. There's a lot of more things they could have done, Judge. They could have kept him in a kennel or a makeshift fence or something uh, to prevent foreseeable dangers. 
And I went ahead and put some case law in there, Judge. But but how do you how do you do that if you didn't take down the fence? That wasn't on them. They didn't know that the fence was going to be removed. Did your client tell them, hey, listen, on this day, I'm going to remove the fence. Therefore, you should probably take a <clears throat> affirmative action in creating a secondary kennel or putting them in a kennel. I mean, well, just even have a I kennel. Think- yeah, I think that's something that shouldn't be imposed on the client, on the, on the plaintiff. The plaintiff started removing the fence. These people can see that. They obviously chained the dog because that was that was what was going on. So they could have taken further action because they knew this dog was dangerous. So it's not on her. It's on them, Judge. She did not know that this dog had attacked a child before. And she did not foresee this from happening, foresee this could happen. So, you know, it's really everything, all these questions you're making, are good, but to the defendant, why didn't they take further action to prevent this from happening when they knew this dog was dangerous? So they could have removed him. I mean, they knew he had already attacked a child. Not only that, you know, they caused this damage to the fence. The fence needed to be repaired. It was going to fall any moment, Judge. We actually showed the defendant some videos. We have some videos that we showed him. So the fence needed, it was in dire need of replacement. I mean, they, again, they don't, they don't play it. They don't agree with that, but that's a fact issue. And that's something that a jury needs to see. The jury needs to see these videos. If I may, just, just one more thing. I barely got, I think uh, over the weekend, they filed a reply. I want to object to that reply from being considered because I just got this today. Uh, I don't know when they filed, if it was Saturday or Sunday. So we don't work on the weekends. So we just got a copy of it today. I don't even know if it's been accepted by the court yet, but I'm going to object to the reply from uh, from being considered in this motion, this hearing. All right, Mr. Hudgens. Uh, I'll just real, real quick on that point. The rules allow us to reply, file a reply as long as not as long as we're not providing more evidence, which we didn't. Uh, these are just legal arguments in response to uh, in reply to their response. There's nothing in the rules that requires us to file it. You know, three days before, two days. Or on the reply itself, okay. So I think the court is is able to consider it, but I think the I think the court really hit the nail on the head when you were asking what else could the defendants have done. I mean, this is our property. This is our backyard. Really, the only one who would have had access to our backyard would have been, other than the defendants, would have been the plaintiff, because unless somebody else decided to come on. Uh, the, unless the plaintiff decided, I guess, to invite somebody to her home and let them go in the backyard and come into ours. But, you know, from the defendant's perspective, the only thing they were worried about was let's keep our dog tethered to a chain so he can't go anywhere. Uh, you know, uh, my client, Mr. Fabella, is a Border Patrol agent, works long hours, and Mrs. Fabella is a nurse. It's so, uh, and that dog uh, by Mr. F- Mr. Uh, Fabella has testified that that dog was not a house dog. Uh, they kept it outside uh, just for whatever. I think I think the what Mrs. Fabella just didn't like the dog hair and that sort of thing. Um, I'm a dog owner, so I'm fully aware of how much dogs can shed at times. So they kept it in the backyard. And what did they do when the fence was down? Well, unlike you heard Mr. Gajardo talk about when the dogs were jumping against the fence, when those dogs were running at loose, as I think what he said, when the fence was up, when the fence was taken down, they put him on a chain so he couldn't get get out and stay in the yard and, and, and you know, do anything. He, he was he was confined to a place he had every right to be. Let me let me ask you this question. Did your clients have noticed that the fence was going to be removed? Is that why they tied the fence, but tied the dog down? I, I don't I, I, I don't know the answer to that, Judge. I, I assume they knew the fence was missing. Uh, I, I don't know if there was any testimony to that effect one way or another. They, they definitely Mr. Uh, put, uh, Fabella, who's the only one that's been deposed. Mrs. Fabella hasn't been deposed yet. But Mr. Fabella acknowledged that the plaintiff wanted to take that fence and replace it. But there, like I said, there's a dispute as to who should pay for what. And then plaintiff, I think the evidence shows, took it upon herself just to do it on her own. I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that Mr. Fabella, the defendants, didn't know that fence was removed at the time of the incident. Uh, I don't know, and maybe Mr. Guajardo can, you know, remind me if he testified to that effect, but it, if I had to tell you right now, I assume he knew that fence was gone. That's, I assume that's the reason he had that dog tethered up so he wouldn't get out because he was an outside dog. So I, and I'm just trying to figure out who gave him notice, like who gave him notice. Cause I'm assuming that the dog is not a tethered dog that uh, lives 
tied to a tree or tied to a stake. I'm assuming that this dog is free to roam within the confines of the backyard. So somebody must have told him, hey, listen, we're going to be uh, taking this fence down. There's you have a dog. You might want to consider tying him up. Otherwise, when we take the fence down, he'll leave and he'll run away. Right. And it's not about the safety of any dog or any person. It's about making sure your dog doesn't run away. <clears throat> I, I think I think this dog, I think there was actually evidence testimony on this, that they would tether him from time to time in the backyard, even before the fence had been removed. So it, but it, it, for whatever reason, they would tether him in the backyard. I, don't, I, I think there was evidence to that effect, but it doesn't really matter because at the time of the incident, he was tethered. There's no dispute over that. At the time of the incident, he was tethered. I, I'm just trying to figure out the notice, whether or not the plaintiff told the, the defendants, hey, listen, I'm going to be doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to tie your dog down. They're going to come tomorrow and uh, start working on the fence. Oh, OK, thank you for the notice. I'm going to tether him down. Well, therefore, the defendant or the plaintiff had notice and should have known or didn't know. I, I'm just trying to figure that that angle out. I don't know if there's any evidence one way or another as to I don't I don't believe there's any evidence. And Mr. Bahardo might correct me. And I'm, I'm, I'm free to listen to him, of, um, of Miss Fabella knocking on the door. <laughs> hey, the fence guys are here and they're going to be tearing the fence down today. I, I just think the fact that the fence was torn down. I assume my client saw that it's, it's part of his you know, yard. I assume he saw that the fence was gone and realized what was going on. So uh, judge, if I may, a um, couple of things. Well, first of all, if I want to remind, remind the court that there was a letter sent out to them saying, Hey, we need to fix this fence. Uh, you haven't addressed it. Apparently the defendant uh, had told Ms. Uh, Ms. Canales that they were not going to pay for any repairs. So that's why she sent the letter. Now there, that's a dispute. When I deposed Mr. Favela, he did say that, look, it probably needed about 10 or 20 boards. I was willing to pay for that. My client says, no, the whole fence is damaged. There's a video. Uh, and he never offered to pay for even 10 boards. That's what she's saying. But I think the focus is not, should not be on the fence judge because not only would it be obvious uh, that, they, that something's going on and they, they needed to tether a dog. Um, I think it's the dangerous propensities and what they did thereafter uh, knowing that this fence was being uh, was being removed, uh, I think they should have done a lot more. And the case law that I cited on my on my response does say that they should have taken additional measures to. I mean, suggest that it, they should have taken additional measures to protect anybody from uh, from a, a foreseeable kind of danger for these uh, dangerous propensities of the dog. Which I would argue they even did. if there was no fence at all, Judge. Even if there was no fence at all, if they knew this dog was dangerous. Many things can happen. A child can come over, a dog can come over. Uh, anything else can happen. Anybody can get hurt. So they should have had the foresight to do more. And that's what the case law imposes on them when it talks about strict liability. And I would, I would just, my last argument would be this, this didn't happen in a front yard where someone can come from off the street and, and, and you know, is able to get access to the dog that might be chained up in a front yard. This happened in a backyard. The only way anybody can get to that backyard is either through our back door, my client's back door, the plaintiff's back door, or someone deciding to hop over a fence, one of the other fences, and uh, when they didn't have permission to do that. So, uh, and, and by the same token, this could have been a, a child. Maybe, maybe the plaintiff could have had a child that went over uh, to visit and ran across the. the uh, to the neighbor's yard to play with the dog. And it doesn't have to be the exact same fact pattern that we have here so that the plaintiff, the defendants can know that their dog, they should have done more to protect from harm. I, I just, I disagree. So if the law in Texas is you can I, I either, you can be responsible if your dog who's tethered to a chain in your backyard bites somebody or trespasses or you cannot. Uh, and I just don't think the law in Texas allows you to be responsible for that. Well, and technically he would be right, Judge, had they not known that this dog had already hurt somebody else and sent them to an emergency room. So that's where, I mean, that's the general rule, but the exception is that they had knowledge. All right, guys. Um... You'll have an answer by Friday. Thank you, Your Honor. May we be excused? Well, Thank you. Excused. Have a good week. Thank you. You too. Okay. All right, Mr. Denzer, who do you have? Judge, I'm uh, standing in for Guillermo Tijerina on CL 18 6902H. 
Melissa uh, Horner Martinez versus Tadia uh, Arevalo and Farmers Insurance. Correct. Um, and it's uh, I, I'm representing defendant Arevalo. All right. Is Ms. Dora Garza is the plaintiff's Garza counsel. Present. Don't see Ms. Hi, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. Melissa Martinez. Oh. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Are you represented by Ms. Dora Garza? Ms. Yes, Your Honor, I am. I know she was logged on. I think she's she dropped off. She I was, know we, the dog story. I'm telling you, <laughs> she was like, "Okay, it might be longer." I'm joking, Your Honor. I apologize. No disrespect, <laughs> but Judge, it was just an announcement. Um, uh, Miss Garza spoke with Mr. T. Hidina this morning, and uh, they they provided all the documents that we requested. So we were just announcing that we could pass this hearing. Um, okay. We didn't announce it earlier because they were, they were still talking uh, while we were logged on to the hearing, but um, now things have been sorted out. Oh, perfect. Passed by agreement then. Can we get a rule 11 that there's been a, uh, an agreement reached? Mr. Denson? Sure thing, Judge. Perfect. Passed by agreement, rule 11 forthcoming. All right, Judge, may be excused. Yes, you may, Thank Sarah. you, Your Honor. May I be Thank excused? Yes, both of y'all are excused. Thank, Thank you. you, Your Honor. You have a good day. You too. Thank you, sir. All right. Who else do we have that's ready to make an announcement? Mr. Gibson. Hey, how are you doing today? Your good, Honor. Mr. Gibson. What case are you here on? I'm here on CL 202521H. I believe the party's names are I have it here somewhere. The number uh, CL 202521H, Antonio Silva, Armanda Silva versus Myra Flores and Salvador Rodriguez Jr. That's correct, Your Honor. I'm here um, standing in for the uh, lead attorney. Um, I spoke with uh, Ms. Karina Garza de Luna this morning. She's the defense attorney on this case. She has a, I think, a nasal infection or some sort, so she wasn't able to make it. But we are uh, scheduled for mediation with Mr. Mike Zanka on April 26th. Now, I, I'm showing, I know that Ms. De, La, De Luna is on a case, but that's on another one. I, I'm showing Jaime Bailly. Are we talking about the same case or a different case? Or We are. Uh, I think it hasn't been updated on the register, but there is a substitute service, excuse me, substitute of counsel filed back in February of this year. So and on CR 202521H, it's Ms. De Luna as well. She's on both cases. Correct. I think if uh, the court looks at the um, register back in, I think, February or March, they filed a motion of um, substituting counsel, lead counsel. Uh, Mr. Bailly no longer works with um, Chavez Legal Group, a.k.a. Fred Loya Legal Group. Okay. Um, so he would not be the attorney, nor does uh, Mr. Davis, um, not Davis, but Justin Davis. He doesn't work there uh, okay. as well. So, okay. um, so, so you're, this is sitting at number two of four for the week and you're announcing not ready and that's correct i spoke with cream with miss uh, garza de luna this morning and she said i asked her what would you be announcing and she said not ready so this is the first setting your honor i believe okay so let me go ahead not ready okay let me and give we'll, you a new dcc okay uh may 18th 2022 at 2 30 okay if those days work for you or that time works for you, then that takes care of uh, number seven on my docket. Hopefully we won't need that. We'll have it mediated and settled by with Mr. Zank on the, on the 26th. So. Awesome. Oh, and another, okay. incidentally, Your Honor, on a different case, if I may. Go ahead. On this case, um, uh, Escalera, uh, Consuelo Escalera, we were number one on the trial docket. For the ninth CL 18 16 13H. Is it on today's docket or not? No. No, I just want to make sure that was is we uh, sold the case. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for giving me that information. No, nope, no worries. Uh, that's all I may I have. May I be excused, Your Honor. Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Daniel Santos, you have Ms. De Luna as well. Uh, this is uh, the next one on the docket, CL 20 40 97 H. Uh, Dario Fernando Galan Jr. versus Bethany um, Malovese. That's correct, Your Honor. Right. I believe there's a Romo as well. As yes, Maricelda Cano Romo. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. And your announcement on this one, 
Good morning, Judge. Uh, yes, we're set for a trial on uh, May 9th, uh, but we've got a mediation that is scheduled for May 25th. So we we're going to ask the court for more time. This is actually, we set it up back in early part of March, maybe even uh, starting February, but uh, this was the earliest date we could get. So I think that'd give us a good shot, see where we stand after that, and then, uh, and then be able to move forward with the trial setting. Let me give you a DCC after May 25th, since uh, we've already got two, one case that's announced ready for trial for that week. After May 25th, give me a DCC, that'll work. Wait, um, can I give you the 31st? Uh, May 31st? May 31st, 2022 at 3.30, Mr. Santos. At 3.30, okay. After the uh, mediation. So if the mediation is successful, just let us know and we'll remove it from the uh, from the necessity of having that telephonic DCC. Okay. And I'll go ahead and forward the information to Ms. Uh, De Luna as well. De Sounds Luna. good. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Judge. It's all happy. You or have a good day. Thank you. You too. All right. Mr. Carlos Hernandez, are you ready to have your case called? Yes, Your Honor. Carlos Hernandez present on behalf of plaintiff Roberto Caranca and cause number CL20 dash 3785 dash H. I think Mr. Zuniga's here on behalf of the defendant. All right, uh, so we have Carlos Hernandez. And... I'm also here with uh, Jose Gonzalez, Jose G. Gonzalez, he should okay. be here. Good, good morning, Judge, I'm, I'm Carlos's co-counsel. He's the he's lead attorney on this case. Perfect. Right, good morning, Your Honor. I, I, did, I did not bring either Rex Leach or Susan Sullivan with me today. <laughs> All right. Okay. What do we got? This is uh, Mr. Zuniga. This is your motion for summary judgment. That's right, Your Honor. Uh, this is a case where it's a claim of discrimination. I, I represent the defendant. And the issue before the court today is, is a motion for summary judgment. We've moved for summary judgment on this case for a few really good reasons. I'll try to outline the basic ones for the court. Um, the details, of course, are outlined in our motion for summary judgment and supported by the exhibits that are attached to it. But in short, the issue is whether the, the plaintiff can uh, establish a prima facie case for discrimination, whether they can rebut the, the defendant's legitimate reason for the decision to uh, let him go, whether the plaintiff can refute the presumption of uh, the same actor defense, and whether they actually uh, exhausted all of their administrative remedies. Now, the, the, the plaintiff in this case was 66 years old when he was hired. And uh, that's important, Your Honor, because the, there's some interesting case law that talks about um, that, and I'll quote, an individual who's willing to hire and promote a person of certain class is unlikely to fire them simply because they are a member of that class. The general principle applies regardless of whether the class is age, race, sex, or some other protected class. Uh, it is simply incredible that a company officials who hired an employee, in this case, the, the employee was 50, 51, suddenly developed an aversion to older people two years later. And here, Your Honor, we have an even tighter timeline. He was 66 when he was hired and he was 67 when they decided to let him go. And as, as part of the, the basis uh, for his complaints, there's a few things that the plaintiff complains about. One being that he didn't get a company car uh, immediately. And the reason for that was there were none available. And in, in, in lieu of getting a company car, he got reimbursements for fuel and travel expenses in the interim. The second was that he didn't get raises when everybody else did. Well, that's because he got a string of negative performance reviews, uh, three. And he didn't get a raise when some of the other people in similar positions did. Uh, the, the last was an issue regarding his uh, kind of arrangement in the office. He didn't have what he would consider a good desk, a good place to work. And the primary reason I think that became an issue was because he was doing work for a side business while working for the defendant. He admits that, but he says that he did it only on his personal time while at work. He's got certain breaks uh, that he's able to take and uh, that he did it during those time periods only. Now we say that's not true. 
Um, he took calls uh, related to that side business uh, out, outside of those times. And he was specifically instructed not to conduct side business while at work. And he continued to do it. Uh, so because of the bad performance reviews and because he was performing a work outside, uh, work for another business while at, at, at work, uh, he was let go. And uh, because of those reasons, uh, he, he, he was eventually let go. So uh, the last thing is that he did not uh, exhaust his administrative remedies. And that's because when he made his EEOC claim uh, and in, in that paperwork, he failed to include retaliation as a basis. So therefore the basis of, uh, of this claim is uh, barred because he didn't exhaust the remedies. So, so judge, and I'll consider this a short summary. Our, our arguments are more thoroughly outlined in our motion for summary judgment and supported therein. Uh, but we'd ask this case to be dismissed. We, we hired somebody who was well over the protected age class at 66 and, and, and similar to other cases, but on an even shorter timeline, we decided to let him go, not because of uh, his age. It wouldn't make sense for us to fire him because of his age when we hired him uh, at 66, 26 years above the protected age class. Uh, and we let him go a year later. There was no change of heart. There was no change in ownership where we suddenly decided that uh, someone in their 60s was, was too old. Um, he just didn't perform. He didn't perform and he didn't follow direction. So we had to let him go. And um, we have this lawsuit as a result. Your Honor, may, may I be heard? Mr. Hernandez, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was on mute. First of all, Your Honor, uh, with regard to a prima facie case, uh, we look to the case of what's called Reeves versus Sanderson Plumbing. And we've got to prove certain things as the plaintiff in this case. We've got to prove that Mr. Caranca was over the age of 40 at the time of his discharge. Well, he was 67. We've got to prove that he was qualified for his job as a human resource director. And the record indicates that he had 23 years in the human resource industry. Uh, so he was clearly qualified for his job. Number three, we have to prove that he suffered an adverse employment action. And that was a termination. There's no dispute as to that. And number four, we have to prove that the reason given to him was a pretext. And that is usually a fact issue for the court, to, for the jury to decide, and something that should, should go to the jury uh, in light of the, the prima facie case that has been established. Second of all, with regard to the, the legitimate non-discriminatory reason, they keep contending that he was given three bad reviews. The person uh, that ended up providing the evaluations for Mr. Caranca from the time he was 66 to the time he was 67 was Ilse Fernandez. And at uh, no time did she tell him a, in, uh, verbally that he was ever not performing in a manner that was inconsistent with the expectations that he was uh, uh, expected to perform at. With regard to the side business that he had, he acknowledged when he was hired that he would spend about 20 minutes a day on his own time. He, he was a businessman who had a, a, a building of, of uh, cardboard boxes and they would put fruit in these boxes in Monterrey. It took him about 20 minutes a day to do this job. And he was, he was up front with his, uh, his uh, employer and, and told him, look, I have this side business. It takes me a little while to order these boxes, and then I have this, these, this fruit that is shipped from Monterey, and uh, it's all done very quickly, and I would like to continue doing it. No one told him that that was interfering with his particular uh, business. Third of all, with regard to the presumption that just because Ilse Fernandez hired him at 66 and fired him at 67, that she had no... Uh, discriminatory animus, there was testimony that was uncontradicted in the test in the deposition of Mr. Uh, Garanca, that his ideas were too old, that he needed to sit with the old people, and that uh, he was not going to be given a company car, even though the person that hired him, Ilse Fernandez, was driving in a, a, a Range Rover Evoque 
and she had traded the Range Rover Evoque in for a Cadillac Escalade. When that Cadillac Escalade became her car, the Evoque was available for Mr. Karanka, and rather than give it to Mr. Karanka, who was next in line as a director of human resources, they chose not to provide him with a company car and to make him submit mileage reimbursements. Other examples of discriminatory animus towards Mr. Uh, Karanka include he didn't even have his own desk. This man, in, in Spanish, we'd call him a don because he's so old that we respect our elders. They wouldn't even give him a desk. They gave him the, a corner of a desk that he had to share with somebody else. And uh, in so doing, uh, he had no privacy in conducting very sensitive uh, human resources activities for Trancasa. He couldn't talk in private about people's job performances, about obtaining laptops, about getting back cell phones, about people who were going to be terminated. All of this was done from a desk that he shared with another individual when all other company directors who were younger than him had their own desk. I mean, we're not asking for, for uh, uh, some type of extravagant desk, but just his own desk to work at. He, he did not have that. So with regard to this re rebuttable presumption, well, because Ms. Fernandez must have uh, hired him at 66 and then fired him at 67, that's a rebuttable presumption. And we have successfully rebutted that presumption to go to the trier of fact that based on these situations with your, your ideas are too old, uh, you've got to go sit with the old people. You don't have a car. We're not going to provide you a desk. And that there is a uh, dispute over whether his evaluations were bad or whether he was told he was doing an excellent job because at his termination, he was told he was doing an excellent job and was even provided a severance. And most, like, most, most of the time when you're provided a severance, uh, it's not because you're doing a bad job. You don't, you don't reward ba bad performers and give them a severance. And those are things that the jury should consider. Uh, the case on point is Sanderson Plumbing by the U.S. Supreme Court, where they said, you're so old, you must have come over on the Mayflower. And that one statement alone, you're so old, you must, come, must have come over on the Mayflower, was enough to let the case go to the jury. And this particular situation where we've got your ideas are too old. You need to sit with the old people. You, you're not getting a company car and uh, you can't have your own desk. Surely rises to the level of Sanderson, uh, Reeves versus Sanderson plumbing. And for those reasons, the summary judgment should be denied. With regard to the retaliation claim, Mr. Karanka filed his own paperwork. It is not a sophisticated individual. But the case law provides that if you look, if you file with the EEOC or the Texas Workforce Commission Civil Rights Division, and one of the issues that's going to arise out of the filing is retaliation, you don't need to file the retaliation. You don't need to check that box because the investigation, that that issue will arise from the investigation. And that case is Gupta versus East Texas University. And there's also another one called Elga Hill versus uh, Fort Worth. And those two cases provide, Your Honor, that you don't need to exhaust your administrative remedies if the retaliation was going to arise out of the initial charge of discrimination. And if it does arise out of that, that uh, uh, initial charge of discrimination, then there's no need or that you can bypass the exhaustion remedy and Mr. Karanka, when he was a pro se plaintiff who had no idea about this, and by the time he hired me, his deadlines had passed, should not be penalized for. And for those reasons, Your Honor, Mr. Zuniga's motion for summary judgment should be denied. We provided you with an appropriate proposed order. The evidence is attached to our motion. The exact pages that the evidence is on are all referenced for you, and all of the case law that is been cited uh, uh, supports a denial of the motion for summary judgment. Does anybody got anything else to add? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I'd like to answer a couple points. Uh, one, on the prima facie case issue, the, the first kind of barrier, the, the issue that we take, uh, the, the, the problem we have is the qualified portion. 
yes, he has a background um, in the area that we hired him, but we, we learned while he was on the job that he wasn't able to perform that task because he wasn't qualified. Um, and that is a requirement for them to show a prima facie case. But even if the court provides, finds that there was a prima facie case, um, the court should grant summary judgment because there is a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. And it's on the plaintiff to show that there's some connection between his age and the negative employment action. And the way he attempts to show that is through a statement. You have old ideas or go sit with the old people. Just because you refer to somebody's age doesn't necessarily mean that there's uh, an inference that you're gonna get fired for that reason. Um, Your Honor, I, I, have a, I work with uh, a lot of people that are over the age of 66 at my firm. And just because that they're of advanced age does not mean they're not supremely capable. That's not, doesn't mean I can't refer to their age. Doesn't mean I can't acknowledge that uh, my partner, Mike Mills or, or Fred Beal or Gary Gerwitz is of, of, of a certain age. But uh, that's what opposing counsel would ask you to do, to find that referencing somebody's age and, and, and frankly, the statements that, that, that he's referring to are not statements made by somebody at our company. They're, they're self-serving statements made by plaintiff. So we have plaintiff saying that these things were said to him, which uh, of course are, there, there's hearsay issues involved in that, but we won't go down that path today. But what I'd like to point out is they're, they're not coming from depositions of our employees they're, they're, or, or anybody that made an employment decision on behalf of the company. These are statements that are, are being repeated by plaintiff. Uh, so we have self-serving testimony in that regard. And what I think plaintiff is asking for here is to be treated like a don. That, that was the reference that we should respect our elders. But your honor, he was the newest person in that position at the company. So no, he didn't get a vehicle right away. No, he didn't get the desk, uh, the seating position that he wanted. But if, if he wants to come in as an equal, it, it, he doesn't get positive discrimination either. You come into a new job, you come in just like anybody else. And if he expected to be treated like a Don, like opposing counsel uh, mentioned, uh, I don't think that's the right way to come into, to come into a job. And if, if he wasn't treated like one, that's not discrimination for his age. That's just not getting an affirmative uh, benefit uh, to it, of which there is no uh, penalty under the law. Uh, the, the last thing I'd, I'd like to um, to get well, two more things. One, the idea that there was there was a severance, therefore we must have been happy with him. Your Honor, is it going to become the law that we're going to punish companies for 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 giving people a severance on the way out? I mean, you don't have to be fired for cause and create animus with somebody who's on their way out. It's extremely common to, to have a severance for somebody and hope they leave on good terms and there's goodwill behind. Just because they weren't a good fit and weren't able to get the job done doesn't mean you wish them ill and want them to have trouble putting food on the table going forward. It just means that you're not a good fit for each other. And that's what we had here. No one's saying that he stole from the company and was fired for cause. Uh, that we're just saying that he wasn't a good fit because his background and his um, qualifications didn't match what our company needs. The last thing, uh, the failure to exhaust remedies, that's gonna be a purely legal issue. We disagree with the opposing counsel's analysis. Um, I'll, I'll defer to our briefing of that on, on the, in our motion. And uh, I don't think, you know, I understand he, he filed his initial filings pro se, but that's, there, there is nothing in the law that gives him the benefit of the doubt while filing pro se. I'm sure if opposing counsel would have gotten the file in time, he would have updated it and, and, and would have corrected those, uh, those issues. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case for his client. Mr. Hernandez, any last response? Yes, Your Honor. With regard to the legitimate non-discriminatory reason that my client is not a good fit, what, the, what Mr. Zuniga is really saying is Mr. Caranca was just too old to do the job. And when you stood, when you're, when you're, when you're, it's nice to couch it in terms of we're giving you a severance, we're taking care of you, but at the same time, severance are, are not provided to people who are, are not performing well. I, 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 I do enough employment law that severance is provided to people who are top performers who are leaving under 
uh, maybe somebody else got hired instead of them, their job was eliminated. Uh, those are the type of situations where a severance is provided. Uh, so I think there's a legitimate dispute over whether he was fired because of his age or whether he was fired because he wasn't a perfect fit. Well, but, and, but, why, but how would you justify the fact that he got terminated within a year of getting hired? I mean, I mean, it wasn't like he became, uh, he, he was one of the older uh, employees at the company and they were paying too much to some of these more, with more seniority and they got rid of him. I mean, he was there for a year. That would lead me to believe that he wasn't a good fit. Well, I think, Your Honor, in looking at this, there's a, another Supreme Court case that in, in analyzing summary judgments, it's called Tolan versus Cotton at 134 Supreme Court, 1861, 2014. The Supreme Court reversed the Fifth Circuit and said, district courts are to view summary judgment in the light most favorable to the non-movement and credit evidence that contradicts key fact, factual assertions of the movements and not weigh the evidence. And what we're doing is we're weighing the evidence. We might not like the fact that he only worked a year and it might make sense to you that uh, perhaps he wasn't a good fit. But when you couple that with you're too old, your ideas are too old, you need to sit in the area with the old people, you're not provided a desk, you don't, you're not provided a car, and there's a dispute over whether or not his performance evaluations were satisfactory or not, the cumulative effect of that evidence has to be taken in the light of the non-movement. And taking in the light of the non-movement, the jury makes that decision, not the court. While the court, I, I respect the court's analysis and saying, well, that makes sense. Well, that's, that's why there's a rebuttable presumption. It's not a irrebuttable presumption that somebody who's only worked a year can't, can't have a uh, age discrimination. It's a rebuttable presumption, which says, yes, tell us the fact that you only worked a year and that leans towards the fact that it wasn't discrimination. And then we allow the plaintiff to come back and say, now give me the circumstantial evidence that you have that it was discrimination. And if you have to weigh it, then you've got to deny the motion. And for those reasons, Your Honor, the motion should be denied. So who, who was the one, I, mean, I know it's been said several times, but maybe I missed it initially and that was my fault for not, therefore missing out. But you, Mr. Hernandez, have said that uh, they said you're too old for this job, go sit with the old people. Who said that? Who, who at the company said that? Or was that just kind of a... Well, that, was in, that was in his deposition. I believe it was Ilse Fernandez. And was that his supervisor or who was that person? I believe that was a person that hired him. Oh, the person that hired him was telling him that. Yes, the same person that fired him. So that's why I say when you have this irrebuttable presumption, this rebuttable presumption, not irrebuttable presumption, but rebuttable, look at all the evidence and say, am I having to weigh it? If I'm having to weigh it, then I got to let it go to the jury. If I, if, I, if I don't have to weigh it and it just, and, it, and, and I, there's no evidence there, then I would agree with Mr. Zuniga, but there is evidence there that says in order to reach Mr. Zuniga's conclusion, you'd have to weigh the credibility of the evidence that was presented to you. Your Honor, what he's getting at though is, is what I referenced earlier. It, to, to not be able to ever reference anyone's age, because it's, it's, you can reference people's age without it being negative. And uh, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, that you can't talk about what somebody's age is, especially when they were hired in at that, at that very age uh, for a position. It, it, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense that you, can, that you can be found to be uh, firing someone based on their age and you brought them, brought them in on that and not be able to reference that same age that you hired them in at. It's not like, you know, I, I hate to use a, a, a examples from, from my own firm, but I mean, Carl, Carl Hamilton has been at my firm for, for 50 years. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's an exaggeration or not, but he's probably been practicing for about that long. And he's, he's one of the, the brightest minds in, in real estate law that I know as far as litigators and extremely qualified. And I would very much not hesitate to, to, to reference his age in, in any manner. Uh, but 
what, what opposing counsel is asking us to do is to just to not be able to, to, to reference something that on its face isn't a problem. And I don't see why his client is having to make it one. All right, Your thank Honor, you. Go lawyers, ahead. Our lawyers are different than the average run of the mill employee. Lawyers have a longer shelf life than say the average employee who can get replaced by a 20 year old making half their salary. I'm sure that Mr. Uh, any one of Mr. Zuniga's partners that are in their seventies is irreplaceable because of the knowledge that they have accrued over those 50 years. They can't replace them with a 20 year old. And that's the reason for that. Secondly, your honor, if we keep up with things of current events, we we're always talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And because of those things, we don't talk about people's age. We don't ask when they graduated from high school. We don't ask what's their date of birth. We don't ask when they graduated from college. We just ask for their degree so that we can get away from discriminating against older folks. And th these things are documented by the Association for the, uh, Amer the American Association for Retired Persons. They're having a very difficult time finding jobs that are over 55. So this is not something that's new. And with lawyers, you're picking out a, a, a different skill set than with the average employee who, as he or she ages, becomes more and more fungible because a, a, a kid that has more computer skills can take that job. And the courts have said, we're going to protect people who are over the age of 40, and we're going to give them this added protection that we don't give other folks. And we're going to try and even the playing field as best we can. And when there's evidence that is that is uh, conflicting, we allow the employee to present their case. Now, if they lose at court and the jury says, no, it wasn't age discrimination, at least they got their day in court and they and they were they were poured out. So so be it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Zuniga. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. The, I will review the, uh, the pleadings that you all have submitted, plus your oral arguments. And you'll have a decision by Friday. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Guerrero, I know Mr. Sanchez. Is Mr. Sanchez still back there? He had a uh, a real quick um, occupational driver's license hearing. Actually, he stepped out moments ago. Sergio. No, he just stepped out. Okay, I'll take your announcement, Mr. Uh, Guerrero. So, oh, Judge, my mind is not an announcement. We have a, a hearing today for temporary or a temporary temporary orders in this case. Mr. Garza, Aurelio Garza, is on the other side, and and his client, I'm, I'm thinking, is on the on on the online. My client, Mrs. Maria Garza Alvarado, is there in um, in my office, Your Honor, um, and she's prepared to testify. Uh, she is a Spanish speaker, and we filed a temporary restraining order <clears throat> and requested this hearing, Judge, because. She feels threatened by her uh, husband, Michael Anthony Arriaga, in their home, and um, so we 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 were we were going to ask the court to award her possession of the home before it gets sold or while it's being sold um, because of an incident that was reported uh, to law enforcement. Um, Mister, my our allegations are, and my client's going to swear or testify to this. Mister Michael Anthony Arriaga. Um, does drink and when he drinks he gets uh, aggressive and on this particular evening after she returned from Spain the day with her daughter uh, I'm gonna object your honor uh, you know if, if we can get property. the te testimony going I mean certainly we can get the testimony but you know at this point um, you know when the report was actually even made as I understand Miss Ariaga uh, still stayed at the home with Mr. Ariaga so this is such an emergency. I'm not understanding why Ms. Ariaga was staying in the home. And Mr. The, Ariaga has not been arrested on those uh, false allegations. Well, the, the, the report was made and Mrs. Ariaga locked her door and stayed in the home because she's got no other place to stay. So, I mean, both of them, Mr. 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 Michael Anthony Ariaga could have easily left. Um, and But Mrs. Ar Mrs. Alvarado stayed at the home. So the, obviously the dispute is, Staying at the home while before this house is sold, because the property belongs to both of the parties, was bought, bought during the marriage. So that would be the testimony. And so I'll have my client testify about how she feels threatened, how he drinks. Okay, Mr. Garza. 
Your Honor, no, at this point, we're just respectfully requesting that the uh, temporary restraining order uh, not be heard at this time, Your Honor. Uh, it is very premature and, and uh, allow the court, uh, or I'm sorry, allow Mr. Arriaga to remain in the house as well. Uh, there has not been any arrest on Mr. Arriaga. Mr. Arriaga, as I understand, does not have a, a different place to go to, Your Honor. Uh, and so at this point, we would be respectfully requesting that he remain at the home as well. Well, I think the, the proper, appropriate thing is to have clear testimony under oath by Mrs. Garza Alvarado and, and have Mr. Arriaga testify and, and have him have, have the court determine whether the environment is in fact safe. And if the court finds that the environment isn't safe, then make, we can make arrangements to, to um, have Mr. Arriaga move out in the interim. I mean, we can we can also address the issue at the heart of this of this of this case, which is the only real asset of the marital estate, which is the house. The house needs to be sold so the parties can divvy up whatever equity equity they have. So, as I said, Judge uh, Mrs. Uh, Maria Garza Alvarado is there at my office, ready to testify. She will need an interpreter, though. All right, let's do this. Uh, let me. Go ahead and give me one second. I'm going to place you all in a breakout room. I'm going to join you in that room. Okay.
All right, we are back. We uh, after conferring with uh, attorney, Mr. Fabian Guerrero and Aurelio Garza, the court is of the opinion that um, the court's gonna send both parties to mediation. Mr. Garza, visit with, with your client at your office. Mr. Guerrero, um, please let your office know that uh, I guess you'll be over there shortly to talk to your client about the, what was discussed in the breakout room. And we'll see you on uh, May 2nd, 9.30. Sounds good, Your Honor. May we be excused? Both of y'all, all four of y'all are excused, actually. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, give me one second while I take care of one matter that's here in the courtroom. I'll be right back. Ms. Garza Alvaro es para tirar. Ahorita su abogado va a hablar con usted. Person under LG, LG.
Okay, Mr. Sanchez, can you hear me? Vito, I understand that uh, number three, the occupational driver's license, that one has been non-suited. That's correct, Your Honor. I read that. I saw that today in the record. Perfect. Suit file. Okay. That leaves us with uh, Mr. Sanchez making an announcement. Mr. Sanchez, um, this is on uh, the mandatory uh, trial status for Eduardo Ortiz and Georgina Ortiz versus uh, Lu Lucero Ramirez and Alexandra Jackson. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Judge, we haven't gone to mediation. I'm asking for additional time. I understand defense counsel had uh, an emergency or a, a family at that situation, Your Honor. And I, I don't know the whole details other than I'm absolutely sympathetic to that. And I'm asking for more time. Also, this, the, the simple fact that we have not mediated this. Okay, let me go ahead and grant you that time, Mr. Sanchez. I'm going to give you a new DCC, and that new DCC will be May 18th at 3 o'clock. Yes, sir, Your Honor. All right, May 18th, 3 o'clock. Please log on. It'll be telephonic, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. All right, I have an Ali G. Do we have Judge, I believe that's all the state has. When, when we excuse? Yes, you're excused, Vito. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Ali G, can you identify yourself? A L E G. You're on mute. If you can please unmute yourself. Ali G. Looks like I've taken care of my civil docket for today. The court's going to go ahead and log off at YouTube.